we always like to look back um, and we started with Harvey Cushing uh, and contemporaneously with uh, that case that we first saw in 1922. Uh, in 1923, the LA County General Hospital uh, was uh, constructed. And this is OR1 at the Old County. This is where you would have sat. Um, probably wouldn't have made it all the way down to the front row because there would have been some eager senior resident um, trying to get their learning uh, accomplished. Um, but this is, this is what medical education was um, not even 100 years ago. Um, and uh, things have changed. Um, we have a variety of screens that provide data that we can save and share later um, through cameras um, with uh, uh, a lot of technology. Uh, we don't have to rely on the light of the sun anymore uh, because we have these nice OR lights, which is great. Um, we have uh, retractors uh, and uh, electrocautery, both of which existed in some form or fashion for um, a lot of uh, Cushing's career, and it's what enabled neurosurgery to really uh, be performed. Um, and we have a dizzying array of instruments, um, ranging uh, from uh, conventional instruments that could be found in any operating room um, to specialized uh, neurosurgical tools that allow us to complete, uh, you know, sphenoid wing uh, removal fairly rapidly um, and progress to uh, removal of a difficult tumor um, with uh, excellent uh, form and style. And uh, I think it's important to familiarize, familiarize yourself with a lot of these things. Uh, to a medical student, your neurosurgical OR is going to look like this uh, illustration of your cockpit on the right, um, with a ton of gauges and dials and a lot of things that you don't really fully understand, um, including pneumatic or electric drills, uh, bits and hand pieces and guards, uh, power drivers in the spine are becoming more common as well as resection tools such as suction aspiration um, and uh, new generation electrocautery. Um, so it's important to have uh, some understanding about those uh, devices and familiarize yourself with them. Um, Neuronavigation is gonna be a major task that medical students are gonna be involved in, whether it's ensuring the machine is plugged in or bringing a CD there, um, learning how to register the patient accurately is gonna be very important. There's a number of different devices and techniques uh, that will be used for neuronavigation. Um, and uh, I don't want to get too wedded into any one system or any other, um, but this is something that you should know that exists. And the important thing about neuronavigation is it allows you to tell where you are relative to the preoperative MRI, just remembering that it doesn't actually tell you the current state of the patient. So there can be gross inaccuracies um, and difficult conclusions can be drawn from neuronavigation. So uh, just remembering that it has its limitations as well. There's a bevy of neuronavigation systems that can be used, um, including the placement of fiducials for navigation in the prone position where registering the face may be challenging, although newer technologies make this, uh, may obviate some of this, um, as well as the possibility of intraoperative updating to account for brain shift um, and other uh, intraoperative registration techniques that may be useful. Um, the, uh, there's a series of different kinds of operating rooms that you may see as a medical student, ranging from the endoscopic operating room um, with all of its screens and monitors um, to the spine operating room um, with its kerosene and punches, uh, drills, uh, and uh, the loud noises and uh, banging hammers of a classic spine case. Um, Spine instrumentation is a uh, dizzying array and assortment of uh, different implants um, ranging from um, anterior and posterior cervical hardware, thoracolumbar hardware, um, inner body cages and grafts which can be placed from a, a variety of different uh, techniques and positions uh, that we've used and occasionally things that look like hardware um, but are not uh, medical devices uh, such as this nine millimeter projectile that's uh, been inserted in the disc space um, at greater than the speed of sound shown in the bottom left of the screen. Um, intraoperative imaging and robotics is becoming more and more important. Um, the uh, classic hybrid operating room or intraoperative uh, x-ray, CT, uh, you know, O-arm techniques um, have been well studied. Um, emerging technologies that um, you probably will be more familiar with than I am include the use of robotics and robotic uh, navigation in spine surgery, as well as the first uh, FDA approvals of uh, augmented reality um, in the operating room. Um, we don't quite know what the right role is for these technologies um, or how applicable they'll be or whether they provide adequate benefit to patients, but it's important to signpost these as exciting developments that I think you should pay attention to um, throughout the course of your career. Um, I'm just not sure how useful that they're gonna be. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about operating room positioning here. 
um, just to work through uh, some of the common positions that you may see patients and talk through some of their relative um, benefits and drawbacks. Obviously, the goal of positioning in any situation is to achieve adequate access to the pathology in question and provide safe surgery in hopefully a fairly ergonomic position for the surgeon. Um, so supine positioning um, on the left um, is uh, relatively expedient. Um, you have to think about patting the elbows and heels and occiput and where you're going to position the arms. Um, you also have to think about how uh, elevated the head is going to be and uh, whether you're um, going to need any kind of turn. Uh, and that's, those are some of the common considerations for supine positioning. Um, lateral positioning requires extreme care. It's extremely versatile and effective, um, but you have to think about pressure uh, and minimizing retraction. Um, and this is something that has to be planned out pretty well. Um, we rarely use the sitting position at our institution. Um, there's some risk of venous air embolism. Um, it's also ergonomically challenging um, for some, in some surgeons' opinion, and in other surgeons' opinions, they love it. Um, so kind of institutionally, depending on where you are, um, it'll probably be on one extreme or the other. Um, in uh, lateral, uh, three-quarter lateral or park bench uh, positioning, um, you'll have more options for positioning the upper extremities. You can achieve excellent posterior access, um, and you can probably still register the face for navigation, so you may not have to place uh, fiducial markers. Um, and lastly, prone positioning. Um, unlike in canines and humans, uh, prone positioning is challenging and requires a lot of thought. Um, meticulous ass assessment of pressure points, um, where you're going to position the arms. Um, it's a workhorse approach for the spine uh, and for many uh, even lesions in the posterior fossa. Um, so it's something that you'll get very familiar with, but it's important to understand um, the dangers of prone positioning, including um, ischemic uh, optic complications. Um, the operating microscope is going to become your best friend. Um, this is uh, one example. There's a main station and an observer station with adjustments possible to the eyepieces, to the handles, um, and a number of different filters that we can attach now. Um, so there's an entire hours you can spend talking about uh, the operating microscope itself. Um, neuromonitoring is important, um, and we use that for many of our cases. This is showing phase reversal um, during an electrode uh, strip that was placed uh, that spanned uh, from primary motor to primary sensory cortex, just illustrating the point where we had a uh, good phase reversal during this case. Um, and neuroanesthesia is becoming uh, a, uh, a real discipline and a uh, great group of collaborators and teammates. Um, it's important to work well with your team and to understand what their strengths are um, and allow them uh, you know, to really perform uh, exceptionally with good communication with the surgical team. Um, the last thing that I want to mention um, in terms of the uh, uh, etiquette in the operating room, um, I think that, uh, you know, as medical students, that's a major concern. Um, I think uh, the, main, the main thing uh, is that this is going to be institution and scenario dependent, um, requires a good deal of social intelligence. Um, so, for example, um, before scrubbing into a case, you should think about whether or not you're going to need anything uh, during that case, like a gown or gloves. Um, and if that is, you should inquire whether you should be opening uh, the gown and gloves yourself or whatever the nursing staff and uh, surgeon technician staff um, would like you to do. Um, and you can do that in an appropriate and sterile fashion. Um, and if you have any questions about how to do these things safely, um, you should basically wait um, for further instruction and avoid contaminating the sterile field. Um, Questions that you should think about um, during uh, and before you scrub in um, and stuff that we can talk about in, in greater length, deciding to wear loops or not, um, what cases we'll need lead for. Um, we'll often use headlights. There are different types of gloves um, that can be used, including thicker orthopedic gloves and thinner microsurgical gloves, under gloves, um, and uh, you know, another, a number of assortment that will vary uh, depending on the institution. Um, what type of eye protection you should wear, because you should always wear eye protection. Um, what hat or cap to wear, depending on institutional preference. Um, and then gowns come in different sizes. These are just all a brief overview of these topics. Um, and I think uh, one of the other main uh, questions about operating room etiquette is uh, when to scrub in, um, when to watch from sidelines. Um, and uh, I think you should feel comfortable asking the residents at the institution what their advice would be for a case. I know for a lot of our endoscopic cases, for example, um, we may tell students to scrub in if they can assist with the surgical task, but otherwise I think it's very useful for them to remain unscrubbed so they can use, for example, electronic devices to look up information or learn more from that surgery um, rather than uh, being scrubbed in. 
Um, and also if something else were to, you know, necessarily come up, they may have a lower barrier to, to, to learn about something that a, a resident may come in and uh, have a console question or something like that. Uh, conversely, uh, there's a big experiential component to being in the surgical field and being part of the surgical team. Um, and we want our students to scrub in uh, on as many cases as possible. Um, when in doubt, ask. Uh, and then the last thing that's really important to underscore um, is although there's inevitably a hierarchy in the operating room, we want to flatten that as much as possible. Medical students are part of the team. Um, you're part of the team that ensures that the patient is safe, the sterile field is maintained, and the team is functioning properly. Um, and as part of that, it's our responsibility to take care of you, and it's your responsibility to speak up if you see something that you're concerned about. Um, depending on the time-sensitive nature and how acute the observation is, you can decide um, and sort of triage that concern appropriately. Um, I wouldn't shout out about a minor concern during an intricate skull base uh, case um, or bypass, um, but if you see something that's serious, like the patient's arm falling off the table or uh, breach in sterility, it's important that you make that known in a uh, appropriate and timely fashion, um, just as you would if you were a resident um, on the case. Uh, and conversely, we know that these cases can be long and complicated, and you might not always have uh, someone explain everything to you as well as uh, you like. Um, but if you hang in there and bear with it, um, I think you'll find that the OR is going to become your favorite place as well if it's not already. Um, lastly, make sure that you know how to scrub and wash your hands. Um, and if you have any questions about how to do that, um, it's always appropriate to ask the residents about what their preference would be, because um, this can also vary in a small way uh, between institutions. Um, and we want to see you uh, involved in as many cases as we possibly can. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.